I tended mine patiently until its tendrils reached from the Red Keep all the way across to the far side of the world, where I managed to wrap them around something very special. Sorcerer. Hello, my old friend. It's been a long time. You hear me talking, hillbilly boy? I ain't through with you by damn sight. I'm gonna get medieval on your ass. Good evening, Macabros, and welcome to episode 13 of Game of Thrones Rewrite. Today's subject, the Master of Whispers, the eunuch, the spider, Varus. Varus was one of the characters whom I received the most requests for a rewrite. And unlike some of the other characters, such as Stannis or the Blackfish, who I hadn't originally planned to give rewrites to, believe me when I say there was never a debate as to whether or not Varus was going to be part of the series. Varus was perhaps the most, even more so than Littlefinger I'd say, enigmatic and mysterious character of the entire series. While Littlefinger was a man who caused chaos and used that chaos to benefit himself, as we discussed in Sansa's episode, Littlefinger didn't necessarily have a grand master plan. He may have had short-term goals, but he understood, as an agent of chaos, that allowing yourself to get taken by tunnel vision and being too focused on one particular goal or outcome can lead to your downfall. Well, that isn't to say he didn't fall victim to that folly eventually. Now, as we see, Varus is just as much of an agent of chaos, in that he understands, no matter how great his influence or vast his knowledge, there is always that X factor, a level of unpredictability that requires one to stay on their feet and adapt to what may come. And yet, despite this, even from the very beginning of the series, there was a sense that Varus was not just someone who was just wading through the muck in order to secure a place for himself at the top of the food chain, but rather a man who had a very particular end goal in mind, that every action, every reaction, was in pursuit of a singular goal. And this is seemingly confirmed, at least in the books, in the fifth book of the series, A Dance of Dragons, where a game-changing revelation reveals Varus's master plan and his ultimate end goal. And yet, despite us being told Varus's end game, the reason for his pursuit of that end game is still wrapped in mystery. While the motivation of his closest confidant and co-conspirator Illyrio Mopatis for aiding in Varus's grand master scheme seems to be strictly financial, or so he says, Varus's motivation is driven by something else, something that has yet to be revealed to the reader and stands as one of the most engrossing mysteries of the series. And thus, numerous theories have been proposed as to what exactly Varus's deal is, some more likely than others, and some just being downright ridiculous. Like there's one theory that Varus is actually secretly a merman, which is like, what? That's nuts. That's crazy. There's actually a decent amount of evidence supporting it. But uh, yeah, that's a theory for another time. This episode will discuss how we will rectify Varus's rather diminished presence in the second half of the series. But more so, I will spend a good amount of time discussing how the removal of a particular character who is a central element of Varus's grand master plan reverberates throughout the series and theoretically fucks up the character arcs of some of the most essential players of the story. What is so fascinating about the writers removing this particular character from the show is is that once I disclose the identity of this character, some of you not familiar with the books may be left scratching your heads, since his presence in the story may at first appear to be simply a gigantic red herring, and thus you would think him being removed from the story would be completely inconsequential, and yet his omission is anything but. Okay, I'm blueballing again, let's jump right into it. Varus throughout the first four seasons of the show is, like with so many other characters, pretty faithful to his book counterpart, and in both he serves as more of a peripheral character. That is not to say he is not an essential element to the story, but we don't exactly see him as a major player. But that all changes when we pick up with Tyrion after he flees across the narrow sea and discovers what Varus has up his sleeve. In the show, Tyrion flees across the narrow sea to Pentos, where Varus reveals his master plan is to bring Daenerys Targaryen to Westeros and instill her as a just ruler who will no doubt bring a long and plentiful reign of peace and love. Ooh, yeah. Um... Whereas in the book, it's a bit more complicated. We pick up with Tyrion in a dance with dragons after he flees across the narrow sea, but instead of meeting up with Varys, he meets with Illyrio. It is Illyrio who tells him about he and Varys' plan to bring Daenerys to Westeros, and it is Illyrio who convinces Tyrion to seek out Daenerys and offer her his political expertise. So the only difference in the book is that it's Illyrio instead of Varys who meets up with Tyrion in Pentos and convinces him to seek out Daenerys? Not even close. On his way to Volantis to seek out Daenerys, 
Tyrion travels aboard the Shy Maid, where he comes into contact with two individuals, an older man and a younger boy, known as Griff and Young Griff, respectively. But then we are treated to one of the most game-changing revelations of the entire series, as Tyrion ascertains Griff's true identity as John Connington, former Lord of Griffin's Roost, best friend to, and perhaps romantic admirer of, Rhaegar Targaryen, and former hand to the Mad King. John was defeated by Robert Baratheon at the Battle of the Bells, a notable conflict that took place during Robert's Rebellion. In response to his failure, the Mad King stripped John of his titles, and it was said that John, consumed with shame, drank himself to death. And yet, here he is, seemingly in league with both Varus and Illyrio, in pursuit of their master plan. And what is that master plan? Well, after deducing John's true identity, Tyrion then deduces the identity of Young Griff as none other than Aegon Targaryen. Not to be confused with the son of Rhaegar and Lyanna Stark, this Aegon was the son of Rhaegar and Elia Martell. Yes, the same Aegon who was said to have had his skull crushed by Gregor Clegane during the sack of King's Landing at the end of Robert's Rebellion. It is revealed that Varus had actually switched Aegon with another baby, and it was some nameless infant that Gregor killed that day rather than Aegon. Aegon was smuggled across the narrow sea where he was raised mainly by Illyrio and Connington to one day return to Westeros and reclaim the Iron Throne as a benevolent and empathetic ruler. It is further revealed that Varus plans to marry Aegon to Daenerys, creating a Targaryen tag team that will return to the West and, with the help of the Golden Company, who have agreed to back Aegon's pursuit of the throne, and Daenerys, Dothraki, and Unsullied forces, reignite the Targaryen dynasty. Sounds pretty straightforward, right? Well, this is where things get even more complicated. See, Aegon has earned himself a cute little nickname given to him by the fandom, which is Phaegon. Why Phaegon? Well, because this cat probably isn't actually Aegon. In order to believe that Aegon is actually Aegon, we would have to buy that Varus somehow knew how the Sack of King's Landing was to play out and had the foresight to smuggle Aegon away before he could be killed. Not totally unreasonable. However, we would also have to buy that Varus somehow knew that Gregor killing Aegon would result in Aegon having his head crushed or to some extent being left unrecognizable. Now look, Varus is smart, but he's not clairvoyant. If Varus had switched to babies, what if Gregor realized that the baby wasn't Aegon? Or, at the very least, what if Gregor hadn't popped his head like a grape? Then there is a chance that Robert would have realized that Aegon was still alive and sent men after him. And because of this, an exceedingly more likely scenario is that poor baby Aegon died the day of the Sack of King's Landing along with his mother and sister, and this dude is not, in fact, Aegon, but some other child who was raised under the identity of Rhaegar's late son. A fake Aegon, thus Phaegon. As for who other than Varus knows that Phaegon is not Aegon, that isn't yet known. But basically, from what we can ascertain, Varus, after learning that the real Aegon was left unrecognizable, capitalized on this fact and raised another baby boy as Aegon, and has for years been planning his return to the Seven Kingdoms by keeping him safe across the narrow sea and amassing forces for him to lead the West and by using his influence to destabilize the governance of King's Landing, thus making the city a sitting duck. Now as for who exactly Phaegon actually is, well we'll discuss that and Varus' grand motivation later on. But as for right now, let's talk about how Phaegon's omission from the show changes the game. Now as I said, some of you may be scratching your heads right now. So this kid isn't actually Aegon, and is nothing more than a red herring in the book. And since in the show, Varus' plan involves him trying to bring Daenerys to Westeros to basically do the exact same thing as he wants Phaegon to do in the book. So what does his omission change or alter? Everything. Let's first discuss how this changes Danny's journey in the show. So in the show, Danny eventually gets to KL, and we see her let the madness of the Targaryens overtake her, and she burns the city to a crisp. Now, while almost everyone agreed that the way in which the show portrays Danny's spiral into insanity was botched like a motherfucker, many agreed that well, this is probably how the series is going to end. Danny burning King's Landing makes sense as a culmination of her arc. A young, impressionable girl who is given ultimate power and is constantly told that she is destined to rule and conquer her way to a peaceful world, and anyone who stands in her way must be dealt with accordingly. As we discussed in Danny's video, Martin portrays Danny very differently than in the show. In the show, she is this amazing and righteous leader who unfortunately, I'd say, got shoehorned into being sort of a girl power icon, and thus throughout the of the show, the writer sort of leaned into her being more virtuous, whereas in the book, 
Martin portrays Danny as more inexperienced, and while her ultimate intentions may be well-meaning, she doesn't necessarily think her actions through. Through Danny's inner monologue in the books, we get a sense that her reasoning and decision-making isn't as sound as it seems in the show, and we are given glimpses of a more vengeful and wrathful disposition bubbling just beneath the surface. In Danny's episode, we discussed how her attempt at diplomacy in Marine was ultimately a failure, and when she returns to Marine after her captivity by Kaljako and his followers, well, she most likely isn't going to rely on diplomacy to settle the Siege of Marine. But despite this, despite the more vitriolic and violent Danny that may be bubbling just beneath the surface, and the fact that her failure at diplomacy in Marine results in her resorting back to her more iron-fisted ways as we saw in, say, Astapor, there is still a gap. Sure, when Danny rolls up to Westeros, she is most likely done with all that kumbaya noise and is ready to crack the skulls of whoever gets in her way. But that still doesn't explain how it leads to Danny burning the citizens of King's Landing. In both Danny in Theon's videos, I offered some makeshift solutions as to how we could get Danny to burn KL, mostly by forcing her hand in one way or another. But in the book, there is a good possibility that Danny burning King's Landing will be due to her just losing it. But what is the trigger? What is the one thing that sends Danny over the edge? Let me give you a scenario. You have been abused your entire life by the one person who was supposed to be there for you. You were sold as basically a glorified trophy to a barbarous man, and yet despite this you are able to take control of your life via making that barbarous man fall for you and learning to love him and his people, only to have the man you love and your unborn child ripped away from you. You then take leadership over your man's clan and are adored and respected by them. You travel the land seeing the inhumane treatment of so many innocents by evil men and decide to show them no quarter. And yet upon Upon realizing that you may be letting your rage and anger for these evil men turn you into someone you are not, you decide to play ball. You decide to try your hand at doing it their way, by playing nice by playing the game. And yet, you are punished for it. Your people turn against you, and those evil men begin to close in, threatening to take everything you have built. You are imprisoned by those who betrayed your love, and it is then you realize that such a brutal and evil world has no patience for anything other than swift and brutal action. And thus, you drop the diplomacy BS, and to ensure that the people you seek to protect are kept safe, deliver unto those evil men severe punishment. You realize that in order to make the world a better and more loving place, you cannot show mercy to those who stand in your way. And then you travel across the sea to your homeland, to the place your family was slaughtered and you were forced to flee. For years you have been told that this is your destiny, to return to your place of birth and rekindle the dynasty that was robbed from you by the very man who led a rebellion against your father and killed your brother. Finally, the time has come to take your place on the throne and begin your quest to free the people of the world from their chains, from their oppression, from their pain and suffering. And then all of a fucking sudden, some little prick just rolls the fuck up, having accomplished basically nothing compared to what you have, and fucking ruins it. My personal theory is that Fagon will eventually reach Westeros with the backing and support of the Golden Company and most likely Dorne. We'll discuss that later in the series. Danny, after taking care of her foes in Marine, will make her way to Westeros with her forces, only to find that Fagon and his posse have already either besieged or maybe even taken King's Landing. While the show has the final conflict of the series taking place between Cersei and Danny, there is a chance that Cersei may be, while not necessarily killed, put out of commission by the time Danny rolls up for the Iron throne. How the ongoings of the North and Beyond the Wall will fit into the series' endgame is yet to be seen, but there is a chance that the final conflict of the series may be between Danny and Fagon. What is so brilliant about this being the final one-on-one -on -one is that it puts Danny into the worst possible position. Whether or not Fagon is in fact Aegon, well, it doesn't really matter. It matters if everyone believes he is. For those who do, and are Targaryen loyalists, they most likely will side with Fagon over Danny, simply due to the fact that he is believed to be the son of Rhaegar. And let's not even start with the gender dynamic that will most certainly be at play. Cocks are important, I'm afraid. Nice. Fagon rolls up and quickly dispatches the Lannisters and takes a crippled King's Landing with the support of both the Golden Company and Dorne. The people of King's Landing then praise their newfound hero. Meanwhile, Danny lands a Dragonstone as she does in the show and partners up with the Starks and perhaps even Stannis after the Boltons have been dealt with in the north. Danny eventually makes her way south to take King's Landing only to find that Fagon has taken the throne. Not only that, but the people of King's Landing are totally down for him and don't necessarily want Danny to take his place. 
Not only that, but perhaps the Northerners are pretty chill with Fagon ruling King's Landing as well, and don't really see the need to help Danny take the Iron Throne. Perhaps Fagon promised the North independence if they support him over Danny. Not only that, but Danny then sees some of her most loyal and trusted advisors turn their backs on her. Remember, a lot of people who may be backing Danny aren't necessarily doing so because they want her in particular, but because they want to reignite the dynasty of the Targaryens. What do you think Barristan will do? Do you think he would try and assert the son of his good friend Rhaegar? Or do you think the majority of those close to Danny, even those who have been supporting her since the beginning, would advise her to take a knee and wed herself to Fagon to create a Targaryen union on the Iron Throne? This was actually Varys and Illyrio's original intention to eventually bring Daenerys together with Fagon and wed them. But here's the thing. Do you really think Danny, the woman we have seen grow from her young, scared girl into a strong, capable woman who has faced countless traumas and steep adversity to get where she is, do you really think she would be down to be second fiddle to some little twink bitch? Do you really think she would be down to be basically sold off to marriage to a man she doesn't even know, just as she was at the very beginning of the series? Or do you think that Danny would refuse to relinquish what she believes to be her destiny and attain the Iron Throne for herself, even if it means taking down those who stand in her way, to have her destiny ripped away from her after she has been through so much? Also, Fagon's presence may offer the answer as to why exactly Danny ends up burying the innocent civilians of King's Landing as opposed to just those in charge. In her analysis of the final season of Game of Thrones, YouTuber Lindsay Ellis explains that the ending of the series, specifically the Danny vs. Cersei 1v1 the series sets up, doesn't really make any sense. In the show, Cersei takes control of King's Landing via blowing up the Sept of Baelor, thus killing the ever-loving fuck out of the High Sparrow, obliterating one of the most beloved families in the land, and canceling a fuck ton of innocent civilians. <laughs> Ouchtown population, you bro! So it is safe to say that her handling over the city following this is less akin to the people taking her as a righteous savior and more than being horrified of a psychotic, tyrannical ruler. And therefore, in the final season when Danny rolls up with her posse to take the city, well, it's a bit odd that the people of King's Landing aren't totally down for it. I mean, maybe Cersei used fear to suppress the people, and perhaps there was even a sort of propaganda campaign used to make it seem that Danny would kill them all if she takes the city. Not sure where they got that idea. But still, at this point, you'd think the people of King's Landing would have already vocalized their displeasure of Cersei via rioting or insurgency. Hell, look at what they did in Season 2 during the riot of King's Landing. Also consider they were totally PO'd at Cersei in Season 5 during her Walk of Atonement. So the fact that the people of King's Landing are totally sold on Cersei in Season 8 and would not take literally anyone over her at this point seems a little odd. However, let's say that Fagon rolls up with the Golden Company and Dorne, perhaps even with Marcella Lannister in tow, and BTFO Cersei after she retakes control of the city from the High Sparrow and the Tyrells. Then Fagon's arrival, rather than an invasion, would be seen as a saving grace by the people. Fagon wins over the people of King's Landing, and then when Danny rolls up for the throne, and after she refuses to marry Fagon to be second fiddle to him in Westeros, then I could see the people looking to Fagon as their savior, and Danny as their enemy. And because the people of King's Landing have aligned themselves with those who stand in the way of fulfilling her destiny, well... Now you could say, well doesn't Jon revealing himself as a Targaryen in the show serve the same function? By threatening Danny's claim over the throne? No, not really, seeing as... I don't want it. Jon being a Targaryen only matters if he's actively seeking the throne. If Jon really didn't want the throne, then all he would have to do is keep his mouth shut and let Dany take it for herself. But of course, the writers, for whatever reason, had Jon reveal his true parentage to his siblings, which resulted in Sansa telling Tyrion, who told Varys, and then... Ah! Help me, Tom Cruise! But in any case, this doesn't matter anyway. Jon being a Targaryen has nothing to do with the reason that Danny burns the people of King's Landing, and thus its moot. So yeah, while a lot of what I have presented is theoretical, Fagon's presence in the story, rather than being just a red herring, could very well lead to Danny eventually burning the people of King's Landing, due to his presence threatening her claim of the throne. But wait a minute, why are we talking so much about Fagon and Danny and whatever? This is Varys' episode. You've given a theory as to how Fagon's campaign could lead to the burning of King's Landing, but what does this have to do with Varys' ultimate fate? Once again, 
everything. So in the show, there is no Fagon. And Danny is the one who Varys has been setting up to take the Iron Throne, literally for the entire series, even before the beginning of the series for that matter. By Season 7, Varys has succeeded in getting Danny to Westeros, and throughout Season 7 and 8, Danny is seen to be successful in taking control of the land. But then, Varys is told by Tyrion about Jon's true parentage, and then all of a fucking sudden, Varys is like, Actually, that Danny bitch is giving me psycho vibes. Let me completely scrap my entire master scheme that I have been planning for over a decade and give the throne to this whiny pussy bitch. See, while it was completely botched in the show, Varys meeting his end at the hands of Danny, well, this actually makes a lot of sense in theory. The problem is that in the show, it most certainly does not make sense. If Varys was planning for so damn long to have Danny take the Iron Throne to bring about a peaceful reign to the Seven Kingdoms, then surely he would have kept closer tabs on her mental state, right? He most likely would have heard about the slavers of Astapor, the masters of Marine. Surely if his goal was to bring peace to the land, these events would have made Varys question Danny's sanity and leadership capability earlier than the third to last episode of the series. In order for us to buy the scenario the show sets up, we would have to believe that Varys, one of the most tactile and intelligent characters of the series, didn't realize that Danny was going a little cuckoo banana pancakes until this late in the game? What about when she burned the Tarleys? Why does Varys' suspicion that Danny may be going a little nuts only get brought up after he finds out that Jon is also a Targaryen? What if he never found this out? Would he just let Danny take the throne, even with his suspicions that she may go nuts like her good old dad did? To be fair, Varys' sudden change of heart in regards to Danny in the show is most likely due to the fact that the intensity and prevalence of Danny's bloodlust is amped up way too fast in the show to the point where it's just flat out unbelievable. But still, you'd think Varys would have had these suspicions about Danny well before she even got to Westeros. But wait, if this doesn't make sense in the show, then why is it theoretically work in the book? Well, simply put, because in the book, Danny isn't really Varys' main focus. Fagon is. In A Dance with Dragons, we learn the full extent of Varys and Illyrio's plan to bring Fagon to Westeros to rule and wed him to Danny. So as you can see, Danny isn't the most important part of this plan. Even if something were to happen to her en route, Varys still has Fagon. And so far in the books, things are going great. The Golden Company has backed Fagon, and they are currently preparing to lead an attack against Storm's End. As far as Varys is concerned, whatever Danny is up to, well, he doesn't necessarily need her. Sure, it would be nice to have the Dothraki, which is why she was married off to Khal Drogo in the first place, but at this point, they don't seem necessary necessary for Fagon to take King's Landing, seeing as how chaotic the current state of the city is. But now we have come to the element of chaos that I have spoke of. As I was talking about before, Littlefinger was an agent of chaos. He knew that he could use chaos to his advantage, and by keeping his ultimate goals obscured, or perhaps by not having any at all, he prevented anyone from using his desires against him. And yet, despite his discipline, there is one thing he was unable to detach himself from, Sansa Stark. As we discussed in Sansa's episode, Sansa is the one thing that Littlefinger cannot dissociate himself from. She is the one thing that he is unable to act and think objectively about. And thus, at least in my opinion, this will be his downfall. I believe it will be Sansa who eventually turns the tables on Littlefinger and takes him down, which is the scenario we went with in our rewrites for both Sansa and Littlefinger, with Sansa feigning romantic feelings for him in Season 7, thus allowing her to lead him straight into a trap. Littlefinger allowed his guard to be lowered for just a moment. He became too focused on his one ultimate one that it resulted in tunnel vision and black blinded him from avoiding his doom. And as I spoke of the similarities in terms of how Littlefinger and Varys use chaos and obfuscation to their advantage, like Littlefinger, Varys is not exempt from falling to the folly of tunnel vision. Varys' ultimate wish is to get Fagon on the Iron Throne, and thus he allows this to blind him from the element of chaos that threatens to prevent him from reaching his goal, Daenerys Targaryen. Danny was originally married off the Khal Drago, so Illyrio and Varys could incur the Dothraki. Now obviously Danny is a part of Varys' plan, but she is treated as more of an asset. Varys' ultimate goal is simply to marry her off to Fagon. Varys and Illyrio were basically counting on her being as non-active as possible. Varys was probably hoping that Viserys would stick around to keep Danny in her place, and he had Jorah spying on her to keep tabs on her. There is no way that Varys could have possibly foreseen Danny signing off on her brother being killed 
or Jorah falling in love with her and eventually being exiled, or Khal Drogo's death and Dany taking control of the Kalasar, or her killing the slavers of Astapor and taking command of the Unsullied, or her experience in Marine, which will most likely result in her putting diplomacy aside for a more Iron Fist approach at community relations. When Dany arrives on the shores of Westeros, she will not be the same young girl who was sold off like a brood mare to Khal Drogo. She will be a woman who has been through so much, who has grown into the leader of some of the most hardened men and women in the world. So with all that said, You know our queen better than I do. Do you think she wants to share the throne? Fuck to the no. And thus, Varys, due to his focus on Fagon and getting him on the throne, has allowed this element of chaos to grow into a major threat. Had Varys kept a closer eye on Danny, perhaps he could have taken measures to prevent her from becoming such a force to be reckoned with. Instead of the easiest part of his plan, by the time Danny arrives in Westeros, and it comes time for Varys to arrange the marriage between Fagon and Danny, she will have become his biggest obstacle. In addition to Danny's shifting disposition throughout the series, a second element of chaos can be found in Tyrion Lannister. In the book, after Tyrion arrives across the Narrow Sea and meets up with Illyrio, he is sent with Jon Connington and Fagon, to meet with Daenerys. The key here is that Illyrio had planned for Tyrion to meet Danny while he was traveling with Fagon and Jon, and thus, Illyrio most likely assumes that Tyrion, with his skills of diplomacy and persuasion, will help convince Danny to team up with Fagon and take the Iron Throne. However, as we know, Tyrion is kidnapped by Jorah en route, and ironically, Jorah plans to bring Tyrion to Danny himself. At first glance, this may seem odd. Why have Tyrion get kidnapped by Jorah and be brought to Danny when he was on his way to her in the first place? The difference is that most likely, Tyrion will end up meeting Danny upon her return to Marine without the influence of Fagon and Jon Connington. My theory is that Tyrion, upon realizing that Fagon plans to take King's Landing and rule over its citizens peacefully, decides to back Danny instead. He realizes that she is the one who can give him the satisfying revenge he seeks. And therefore, upon meeting with Danny, Tyrion will rather than convince her to team up with Fagon, pose him as a threat to her destiny to sit on the Iron Throne. He will poison her mind with stories of the evil and selfish people of King's Landing, and perhaps even the idea that she is just being used as a pawn by Varys and Illyrio to help secure Fagon's ass on the throne. Though Varys had originally intended for Tyrion to help with this goal, Tyrion turning into a darker character actually hinders his mission. And thus, now I could see how Varys' attempt to remove Danny from the equation could end up leading to him being roasted. Varys, realizing that Danny will not marry Fagon and will stop at nothing to secure the throne for herself, seeks to take her down, via assassination by some means, or perhaps by swaying those close to her to forsake her. Upon realizing he is attempting to prevent her from attaining her destiny, Danny has Varys killed. Later on, upon arriving at King's Landing, Fagon has won over the people of King's Landing and turned them against Danny, after realizing that she won't play ball and marry him to secure a Targaryen dynasty. Perhaps those loyal to Danny and even the Northerners refused to help Danny take the Iron Throne from Fagon, realizing that under Fagon's rule, peace has come to the land. After being forsaken by those closest to her and realizing that the people of King's Landing will never choose her over Fagon, and being earlier goaded on by Tyrion that the people of King's Landing are horrible and selfish people, this is what sends Danny over the edge and results in her burning the streets of King's Landing. But of course, this is all theoretical. Nothing is confirmed, and this theory obviously doesn't detail how Stannis, the White Walkers, and the eventual revelation of Jon's true heritage will fit into all of this. I simply outlined this chain of events to show how Varys' death at the hands of Danny and her eventual destruction of King's Landing could have come about due to Fagon's presence. I honestly wonder if Varys being killed by Danny and the burning of King's Landing were two of the major plot points that Martin disclosed to Benioff and Weiss, and thus they knew they needed to make them happen in the show, not realizing that Fagon's presence in the narrative is a vital ingredient in making these plot points play out in this way, and omitting him from the story will result in the resolution of the show differing greatly from its resolution in the books. This is further supported by how the show works in The Golden Company. In my theoretical scenario, The Golden Company will eventually face off against Danny, but they will be under the command of Fagon rather than Cersei. I honestly don't see how Cersei could possibly eventually take control of the Golden Company in the books. Never say never, but I am leaning towards the theory that D&D were told the Golden Company would face off against Danny at some point, but since they removed Fagon, they instead had Cersei hire them. Okay, so that was a lot. Now let's get into the rewrite for Varys. Now I am sorry to break the hearts of many of you out there listening, but like with Lady Stoneheart, 
we will not be incorporating Fagon into the narrative. As much as I love how much of a wrench his presence in the story is going to be once we reach the end game, and I personally love John Connington as a character, it's just too much of a game changer, and thus it would result in way too much of the show's events being shifted, altered, etc. So yeah, Fagon is out of here. But through our discussion of how his presence may lead to Virus's doom, we have found a way to make his death play out in the show in a way that makes sense and isn't a slap in the face to Varus's continuity of intelligence. So I'm going to skip right to season 5 since, as I said, Varus doesn't really reveal himself as a major player until this point. Varus's arc in seasons 1 through 4 pretty much plays out as it does in the book, so we'll leave it alone. So let's dive into season 5. At the beginning of season 5, Tyrion arrives across the Narrow Sea and is told by Varus of Daenerys Targaryen. Varus convinces Tyrion to travel with him to meet Danny and help him bring her to Westeros. Now I guess you could say that Varus fleeing across the Narrow Sea along with Tyrion is a bit out of character. In the book, Illyrio recruits Tyrion and Pentos, while Varus stays in King's Landing to help make sure that Cersei absolutely botches her ruling of King's Landing, thus making the city easy pickings when Fagon eventually rolls up. But I don't think this is that big of a deal. After Tywin's death and Cersei becomes de facto leader of King's Landing, I could see Varus just assuming that she would do a spectacularly terrible job of governing the city, or perhaps entrusting his little birds to cause some ruckus, basically clearing the runway for Danny when she eventually gets to Westeros. Anyway, Varus and Tyrion then make their way to see Danny, but Tyrion is kidnapped by Jorah. Tyrion eventually arrives in Slaver's Bay and meets up with Danny. Now as detailed before, the key here is that Tyrion meets with Danny without Varus. Had Varus and Tyrion met with Danny together, I imagine that Varus could have convinced Tyrion to help him persuade Danny to take the Iron Throne peacefully. But since Tyrion meets Danny without Varus, Tyrion sees an opportunity to take control. Tyrion knows that Varus wants Danny to be placed on the Iron Throne with the minimum amount of casualties. However, Going along with our rewrite version of Tyrion, Tyrion wants Cersei, Jaime, and the people of King's Landing to pay for what they have done to him. And thus, Tyrion, upon meeting with Danny towards the end of Season 5, will use Varys' absence to his advantage, using the time alone with Danny to start to bend her towards his own will. By telling her of the evils of the people of King's Landing, perhaps even telling her that she would be a fool to trust Varys. Despite her insistence that she wants to use diplomacy to win the people of Marine and later Westeros over, Tyrion convinces her by highlighting his own experience, that the only thing people will respond to is fear and brute force. Tyrion's forewarning is seemingly fortified upon Danny's experience in the fighting pits. After flying away with Drogon away from the city, Danny realizes that Tyrion was right, that her attempt at diplomacy did nothing to win the people of Marine over and only allowed her enemies to close in. Meanwhile, back in Marine, Tyrion becomes Danny's stand-in just as he does in the show. Varys finally arrives in Marine and meets up with Tyrion. Varys asks Tyrion how his meeting with Danny went and if he was able to convince her to take a peaceful approach when she eventually arrives at King's Landing, to which Tyrion says yes. And it is here, with Tyrion lying straight to Varys' face, that we see the beginning of the inevitable conflict that will take place between Tyrion and Varys in Season 7. But first, on to Season 6. In the show, Season 6 sees Varys and Tyrion managing Marine while Danny is held captive by Khal Jaco. This, to me, is one of the weakest segments of the show, and is perhaps one of the worst examples of gap filling. By that I mean, due to them removing certain characters or shifting the timing of events around, certain characters are left in no man's land, if you will, and the writers had to basically just make shit up for them to do. Season 6 and Marine for Tyrion and Varys is a perfect example of this. Varys and Tyrion managing Marine while Danny is gone is rather pointless. That isn't to say there aren't well written and interesting moments, the issue is that all of their efforts end up being pointless since their cooperation with the slavers ends up being scrapped when the slavers end up rebelling against Danny's rule anyway. So all the work we saw Tyrion and Varys do to stabilize Marine ends up being for nothing, and Danny has to come in and clean house. So what can we do for Varys and Tyrion in Season 6? Well, I'd like to use this season to begin to create the rift between Varys and Tyrion. With Danny gone, Varys and Tyrion are left to handle the Sons of the Harpy and the Slave Masters. While on the show, we have Varys and Tyrion working together and basically on the same page. For our rewrite, we are going to see them still work together, but most certainly not on the same page. Varys wants to use cooperation and diplomacy to deal with the Sons of the Harpy and the Slavers, while Tyrion, still filled with bloodlust, wants to use brute force. We see tension grow between the former colleagues as their methodologies begin to drift farther and farther apart. While it is Varys' idea to use his little birds to discover who is funding the Sons of the Harpy, 
so they can negotiate with them, it is Tyrion's idea to release Viserion and Rhaegal in order to make the Sons of the Harpy submit via fear. Once Varys and Tyrion discover that it is the slavers that have been funding the Sons of the Harpy, it is Varys' idea, not Tyrion's, to negotiate with them, as we see Tyrion do in the show. Tyrion, on the other hand, for our rewrite, will scoff at Varys' attempt at negotiation and, due to his increasingly jadedness and bitterness, believes the slavers will never hold their end of the bargain, and the only way to deal with them is to eliminate them. Tyrion is proven right when the slavers launch their assault against the city of Marine. Tyrion and Varys have a heated argument, where Varys realizes his former semi-colleague, known for his even temper and pragmatic mind, is now consumed with bitter bloodlust. Tyrion is just about to sick Rhaegal and Viserion on the slavers when Danny arrives from her captivity. The same scene takes place where Danny and Co meet up with the slavers to discuss terms. Note, Varys will be present at this meeting, because he will not have left to meet with Olena and Ilaria. We'll discuss how the Tyrells and Martells meet up with Danny at Dragonstone later in the Dorn video. Anyway, Danny, Tyrion, and Varys meet to discuss terms. Varys begs them to agree to peaceful terms, but Danny, fresh from her captivity by Kaljako, is having absolutely none of that. She mounts Drogon and destroys the slaver's fleet, while Rhaegal and Viserion burn any sum of the harpy they can find. While the slavers are defeated and the citizens of Marine are released from their clutches, Varys looks on in horror. Varys realizes that Tyrion has influenced Danny and pushed her closer to the edge. The conflict between Varys and Tyrion over who will influence Danny the most, and thus whether her conquering of Westeros will be one of diplomacy and cooperation, or one of fire and blood, has begun. Following the Battle of Marine, the Greyjoys of course meet up with Danny and join her forces, and then they make their way to Westeros. Season 7 picks up with Danny and Co at Dragonstone. Tyrion, with the support of the Greyjoys and Martells, tries to convince her to burn King's Landing immediately, but Danny, despite her Iron Fist way of ruling, decides against this, opting for Varys' strategy of slowly winning the people of Westeros over. Though Danny was shown to have no hesitation for violence with, say, the slavers of Astapor, she will only do so if absolutely necessary. We see that despite Tyrion's influence over her, the more benevolent side of her that wants to be a righteous ruler is still present. Varys realizes that he has not totally lost Danny. However, Varys is at a disadvantage due to Tyrion's planning mistrust of Varys in Danny's mind back in season 5. I think this makes the scene where she chews him out make a lot more sense. She agrees with Varys' ideas, but does not trust him. Tyrion notices this and realizes he still has the chance to push Danny over the edge. Varys then instructs Danny to both send the Greyjoy fleet to ferry the Dornish forces to Westeros and to have the Unsullied take Casterly Rock. Yes, this will be Varys' suggestion and not Tyrion's. It'll make sense as to why very soon. Now, as we know, both of these plans go bust in the show, which is just really dumb. Sure, Yara and her fleet did have to pass King's Landing to reach Dorne, but how did Euron and his fleet know about this? to such an extent that they were able to ambush them. Same goes for Casterly Rock. Why the hell would Jamie and Cersei just assume that the Unsullied would attack Casterly Rock, thus allowing them to take the undefended Highgarden? This was that bullshit about intelligence levels being so fucking wonky in the final two seasons for the service of plot. Sure, Jamie is an experienced battle commander, but this is fucking clairvoyance in action. Also, it's stupid, because how the hell did Euron's fleet, who in episode 2 ambushed Yara's fleet east of King's Landing, manage to get all the way around the entire fucking continent to the Bay of Casterly Rock by episode 3? However, as we discussed in Tyrion's episode, what if the reason Cersei and Jaime were able to ambush Yara's fleet and lay the trap at Casterly Rock was that they were tipped off? But by who? Tyrion, of course. For our rewrite, Varys is the one who instructs Dane to ferry the Dornish forces to Dragonstone and to attack Casterly Rock. So Tyrion, in an attempt to widen the rift between Varys and Danny, anonymously tips off Cersei about Yara's fleet and the Unsullied's attack on Casterly Rock. Tyrion would effectively be helping his sister Cersei in the short term, but with the ultimate intention of making Danny so pissed at Varys and frustrated that she is getting her ass handed to her that she decides to say fuck it and just fly on over to the Red Keep and roast Cersei. Short term losses in pursuit of a long term win. Sounds more like the tactful Tyrion we know and love. The kidnapping of Yara and the Martells and the death of Olena, of course, caused Danny to chastise Varys for his crap ideas. Varys obviously suspects Tyrion of sabotaging his plans, but cannot prove it. Varys must slowly stand by and watch as Danny is pushed closer and closer to the edge. However, the scales begin to shift once again upon the arrival of Jon Snow. As we discussed in their episodes, Rather than establishing a romantic relationship between Danny and Jon, their dynamic will be more of a quid pro quo sort of deal. Jon wants to ensure that whoever sits on the Iron Throne will bring peace to the land. He has seen enough bloodshed and endured enough loss for more than one lifetime, 
and wants it to end. Via Danny, he sees a way to make that dream a reality. And Danny is inspired by John. His journey of rising in the ranks as an outcast bastard into one of the most respected leaders in the land makes her believe that she still has the chance to be the magnanimous leader who could win over the people of the land and make them adore her. Upon realizing that John is starting to bring out the side of Danny that can bring peace to the Seven Kingdoms, Varus begins getting closer to John, influencing Danny via his relationship with John. Danny is obviously mistrustful of Varus, but by getting closer to John, Varus can help him bring out the more peaceful side of Danny. This is much to the displeasure of Tyrion, who sees that John is starting to sway Danny over to the side of peace and love and all that hippie bullshit. Tyrion is even further dismayed by the end of the season when Danny, per John's request, and the belief that it will help her win over the hearts of the people of Westeros agrees to help John defeat the White Walkers. Danny travels with the peeps to KL, where she parlays with Cersei, and pretty much to everyone's surprise, Cersei agrees to help Danny against the White Walkers. Following this surprising development, Tyrion, wondering why the fuck Cersei would possibly be so chill and cooperative, decides to meet with her, the first time speaking to her since his escape from the city after killing his father. They will meet as they do in the show, but under slightly different circumstances. Instead of Tyrion trying to convince Cersei to help the Northerners against the White Walkers, he seems to be confused, almost pissed, that she is all of a sudden acting so cooperative. It is at this moment that she reveals to him that she has no intention of sending aid to the Northerners, and that the only reason she said she would was to buy time. When Tyrion presses her for what she needs time for, he then surmises that she is pregnant. And it is at this moment that we see something shift in Tyrion. Seeing the loving part of his sister, the one saving grace that exists within her soul, her fierce love for her children, moves him. Cersei chastises him, saying that he is to blame for the deaths of both Myrcella and Tommen, given that they died due to the fallout from the actions of Tyrion. Tyrion starts to realize that despite everything Cersei has done to him, her unborn child is his one saving grace, the one chance for him to repent for the monster he has become. Tyrion leaves Cersei and returns to Winterfell with Danny and co. Now on to season 8 and the squad ending up back at Winterfell. Varys is feeling pretty sweet. Despite the unfathomable odds they face against the White Walkers, Varys realizes that if they are able to survive the long night, then the cooperation displayed by the people of Westeros may, just may, lead to peace. But Tyrion knows the horrible truth. He knows that Cersei is not sending any of her forces to help against the White Walkers, and yet he doesn't tell Danny. Why? Because he knows that if Danny knows that Cersei betrayed her and didn't send forces when she said she would, that if they defeat the White Walkers, Danny will be so shit pissed that she will roll right the fuck up the King's Landing and most likely torch Cersei's ass along with her unborn child. Tyrion knows he can't tell Danny, but he also knows Danny will discover Cersei's betrayal anyway if they survive the White Walkers' onslaught. Perhaps Tyrion thinks that after they are victorious against the White Walkers, Danny can be reasoned with, but he is doubtful, seeing as how much he goaded her on back in Marine to take no prisoners. Tyrion decides to not tell Danny to buy himself some time as he tries to think of another solution. Well, that plan gets royally fucked when Jaime shows up in episode 2 and tells Danny that Cersei has no intention of sending reinforcements. Remember, per our rewrite, Cersei doesn't tell Jaime of her unborn child before he heads to Winterfell. Jaime only learns of Cersei's child in episode 5 after Cersei refuses to surrender and Tyrion tells him, hoping that Jaime can save Cersei and her child from their doomed fate. At this moment, Tyrion knows that even if they are victorious against the Night King, Danny will show no mercy to Cersei. Per his rewrite, Jaime is imprisoned by Danny until the White Walkers arrive. Tyrion speaks to his brother, the first time they have spoken since Jaime revealed to Tyrion the truth about Tysha. Tyrion lashes out at his brother, but slowly they make amends. It is here that Jaime sees that Danny is a loose cannon, and that should it come down to it, Tyrion must take Danny out to ensure the world is kept safe from her wrath, just as Jaime did the day he slayed the Mad King. Tyrion does not tell Jaime at this point of Cersei's child, since he can see that Cersei did not tell Jaime, and doesn't want that on his shoulders just before the White Walker battle, and or doesn't want Jamie to know that his unborn child was killed along with Cersei if Danny ends up taking her out. I know I'm talking a lot about Tyrion here in Varys' episode, but bear with me. So as we know, at the end of Season 7, Bran tells Sam about Jon's true parentage, and Sam tells Jon at the end of Episode 1 of Season 8, and Jon tells Danny at the end of Episode 2. Now the way Jon's parentage gets spread around is fucking stupid. He tells his siblings for no reason, Sansa tells Tyrion, Tyrion tells Varys, and Varys gets torched. Now originally in the rewrite, I had Tyrion betraying Varys like in the show, but I sort of realized that that is unnecessary, as you will see. So for the rewrite, Bran tells Sam, and Sam tells Jon, 
and John tells Danny. After the battle against the White Walkers, John and Danny discuss their next move. Danny obviously wants to roll up the KL and end Cersei's whole career, but John begs her to try and settle things peacefully, as he wants no more bloodshed, and considering they lost so many men against the White Walkers, even if they win, the battle for King's Landing will most likely result in total carnage. Danny, however, is not persuaded, especially since after John reveals his true parentage to her. She is paranoid that the people finding out may result in them backing him over her, since he is so well known amongst the people already. John says that he doesn't care about the throne and wants her to have it, saying he will never tell anyone about his parentage. And he doesn't. There is no reason to. He doesn't tell Arya or Sansa. He keeps his mouth shut. However, their conversation is overheard by one of our Varys' little birds. This makes sense since Varys had been trying to get a line on Danny through John. The little bird overhearing this conversation results in two things. One, it tells Varys that Danny is in fact too far gone. He knows that she is hellbent on rolling up and torching Cersei, and thus he suspects that she is too far risky of a leader to leave in charge of the Seven Kingdoms. And two, that John is also a Targaryen. And this is when Varys decides to make his final move. He meets with John in secret and tells him he knows about his true parentage and that he wants him to betray Danny and take the throne for himself. The reason this works better in our rewrite than it does in the show is that one, Varys has had more of a present relationship with John since he sort of buddied up with him in season 7 to try and urge him to keep Danny on the straight and narrow. And two, because in our rewrite, it is established that Varys has been worried about Danny's mental state ever since she burned the slavers of Marine the fuck down. Again, Varys' actions in the show aren't bad per se. It was all about the pacing. His hyperspeed heel turn on Danny was simply ridiculous. Now in the show, Varys, after failing to convince Jon to take the throne, tries to poison Danny, and then he seems to write notes spreading the word that Jon is a Targ. But then something really odd happens. In episode 5, Tyrion meets with Danny who was gone all Naomi Watts in the last quarter of Mulholland Drive. Danny says she has been betrayed by John. This is weird of her to say because there is no reason that Danny would think that John told anyone about his parentage. Like, yeah, I mean, maybe she just assumed he blabbed because he's an idiot, but it's just odd. But what's even odder is when Tyrion just says, Varys. Um, why does Tyrion do this? So Varys tells John, hey, you should BTFO Danny. But he's like, nah. Tyrion seems to put two and two together when he sees them chatting, but then why does he tell Danny? I mean, maybe he is just trying to protect her, but surely if he tells Danny, then Danny will know Varys learned from Tyrion, who learned from Sansa, who learned from Jon. So even if Tyrion wanted to protect Danny from whatever Varys was planning to do, he would know that this would most likely result in Sansa and maybe even himself, and hell even Jon, getting iced, right? It's just weird that Varys is the only one who she kills. Obviously Sansa told Tyrion because she was hoping it would lead to Danny getting disinvited from the barbecue, but why does Tyrion tell Danny about Varys' betrayal when it also reveals the fact that he, Sansa, and Jon all blabbed, putting them all at risk for death. It's stupid as hell. But in our rewrite, we're going to circumvent all that shit. So Varys learns of Jon's true parentage and then confronts him in secret, asking him to betray Danny. Jon says no, and that should be the end of it, right? But how does this lead to Varys' death? Well, because Danny had a spy of her own keeping their eye on Varys, who overheard the conversation between Jon and Varys. While this conversation shows that Jon is loyal to her, it also shows that Varys is not. As for why Danny would have a spy keeping an eye on Varys, it's because way back in season 5, per our rewrite, Tyrion told Dane not to trust Varys. So when Danny tells Tyrion that she plans to kill Varys, Tyrion realizes that it was due to his own actions that led to Varys' ultimate demise. As Varys is led to be executed, he has a final conversation with Tyrion. As in the show, Varys tells Tyrion that he hopes he is wrong and that Danny will rule peacefully. But in our rewrite, Varys will then say that if she doesn't, if she threatens to bring chaos and terror to the world, his final request for Tyrion is to make sure that doesn't happen. Varys is then executed. But despite his death, Varys' request to Tyrion stays with Tyrion. And after Danny burns the citizens of King's Landing, after realizing the deaths of his sister and brother and, at least at the time, his unborn niece or nephew are all on him, Tyrion honors both the wishes of both his brother Jaime and his friend, if you could call them that, Varys' request, and kills Danny when he is given the chance. Through Tyrion, Varys, in the end, saw his dream of a peaceful kingdom with a Targaryen on the Iron Throne come to fruition. And that will wrap up this episode, fam. Now, as you can see, there is quite a bit of runtime left in this video. The reason being that I want to talk a little bit about Varys' motivation for his actions in the book, specifically why he is so dead set on restoring the Targaryen dynasty via marrying Fagon and Danny, 
and putting them on the Iron Throne. Now you could say that he is simply a Targaryen loyalist and believes restoring them to power is the only way to ensure a peaceful kingdom, but in the books there are several theories, one of which I would say is the most prevalent and supported, that explain Varys' motivations. The reason I am splitting this section up after the rewrite is because, unfortunately, Due to the removal of Phaegon in the show, there is absolutely no possible way this particular theory could have been implemented in the show. And therefore, in the show, Varys' motivation is simply chalked up to him wanting a peaceful realm. It's not bad, merely a little thin if you ask me. Anyway, the theory I am talking about offers a more concrete reason as to what Varys' motivation is in trying to sit Phaegon on the throne. If he just wanted peace throughout the realm, why not support Stannis or any other king? Why is he so set on sitting a Targaryen on the throne? Well, Varys is clearly a Targaryen loyalist. Could it be he's even a secret Targaryen himself? Well, I'd argue that this is unlikely. In fact, there may even be evidence contradicting the idea that he is a Targaryen loyalist at all. In order to explain, let's rewind. Varys was born across the Narrow Sea as a slave. At some point during his childhood, he was purchased by a sorcerer who proceeded to castrate him. Later on, Varys' reputation as a master of whispers began to grow, and he eventually met his lifelong friend, Illyrio. They worked together and eventually used their skills to accumulate a small fortune, which Varys used to fund his network of spies across the land. Varys' clout was so damn high that he eventually was recruited by none other than Aerys Targaryen II, aka the Mad King. The Mad King brought Varys to King's Landing as spy master. By this time, Aerys was already starting to go a little cuckoo banana pancakes, and use Varys to keep tabs on any and all threats that may be around him. So you may be thinking, Oh, well this clearly shows that Varys was loyal to Ares and the Targaryens, right? Well, not quite. See, while Varys did work for Ares, he may not have necessarily been looking out for the Mad King's best interests. Varys seemed to only exacerbate Ares' growing paranoia, filling him with thoughts of betrayal around every corner, even from his own son Rhaegar. Barristan and Selmy even went so far as to state the rot in King Ares' reign began with Varys. The Mad King eventually went, spoiler alert, mad, and his rule came to an end following Robert's Rebellion. Now again, you may be saying, well sure, Varys may have only used his position as spy master to further his own influence, and his attempts at driving the Mad King mad was because he wanted someone else, perhaps Rhaegar, to take his place. But if that was the case, then why not just do that? Why not just poison Ares or something so Rhaegar could take his place? Why push Ares closer and closer to the edge? Well, what if Varys isn't a Targaryen loyalist at all? What if Varys used his influence as spy master to take not just Ares, but the current Targaryen dynasty completely down? But wait, then why would he want to put the boy so many believed to be Aegon, the son of Rhaegar, on the throne. Well, as we have already discussed, Phaegon may actually not be a Targaryen. Okay, so Varys just wants to put some rando baby on the throne? Again, why? Well, what if Phaegon isn't random? What if he isn't just some nobody? What if he is a Blackfire? Now, for those of you who have only seen the show, I am sure you are wondering what the fuck I am talking about seeing as the Blackfires are basically non-existent in the show. Even those who have read the books may be a little fuzzy on them, since the house is said to be practically extinct. So let's give a rundown. It's going to get pretty complicated, but I'll try my best to be as clear as possible. House Blackfire came into existence at the end of the rule of Aegon Targaryen IV. To give some frame of reference, Aegon was the great, great, great grandfather of the Mad King. That's how far back we're going. Like our favorite baller Bobby B, Aegon spent his rule smashing away and fathered a whopping baker's dozen bastards. On his deathbed, Aegon made the wonderfully stupid ass decision to legitimize every single one of them, leading to mass chaos. One of those bastards was Damon Waters, who, upon his legitimization, renamed himself Damon Blackfire. Blackfire was taken from the name of the sword of Aegon the Conqueror, the creator of and first man to sit upon the Iron Throne. So Daemon Blackfire eventually led a rebellion against the sitting king, Daring Targaryen II, another son of Aegon IV, and thus Daemon's half-brother. The Blackfires were defeated and Daemon was killed. But shit didn't end there. Over the next half a century, there were a total of four more rebellions against the ruling Targaryens by the descendants of the Blackfire House. Those who claimed the throne over the sitting Targaryen kings were known as Blackfire Pretenders. Keep that in mind for a minute or two. Each rebellion was squashed, and at the conclusion of the fifth and final rebellion, the Blackfire line was said to have been virtually extinguished. But what if it wasn't? What if Varys himself is a descendant of the Blackfire line? What if he used his vast resources and spy network to track down a surviving female member of the Blackfire line? What if Varys traveled to King's Landing and made efforts to sabotage the current Targaryen dynasty, thus making the kingdom unstable enough for a surviving male heir of the Blackfire line to eventually travel to Westeros and retake the throne? 
Whoa, 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 come the fuck on, dude. Look, this is a cute little theory and all, but this is quite the reach, no? I mean, sure, both Varus and Fagon could be both the descendants of the Black Fire line, but what evidence is there to suggest this? Is it just a guess? A speculation? What other piece of information could support this theory? I'm glad you asked. See, way back during the first Blackfire Rebellion, another one of Aegon the Fourth's legitimized bastards, Aegor Rivers, nicknamed Bittersteel, joined forces with his half-brother Daemon Blackfire to aid in his rebellion against the sitting Targaryen king. Upon the failure of the rebellion and Daemon's death, Aegor fled across the sea along with Daemon's wife and kids. While in Essos, in order to ensure that the Blackfire house would never die and would hopefully one day take the throne, Aegor decided to create a sellsword company. And what was the name of that sellsword company? The Golden Company. Not only was the Golden Company founded by the half-brother and supporter of Daemon Blackfire, and not only was it developed specifically to keep support for House Blackfire alive, but the Golden Company fought for House Blackfire during the third, fourth, and fifth rebellions against the Targaryens. After the supposed destruction of the Blackfire line, the Golden Company continued to exist and secure its reputation as the finest and most honorable sellsword company in the world, partly due to the claim that they have never broken a contract in their entire history. Except they totally have. The Golden Company was hired by the city of Mir, but for some unexplained reason, the Golden Company breaks their contract and joins in the effort to instill Fagon on the Iron Throne. But why? Why would one of the most respected sellsword companies just up and abandon their current contract to support some little prick's quest to sit on the Iron Throne? A boy who claims to be a Targaryen for that matter, a lineage that the Golden Company has historically rebelled against. Simple. The leaders of the Golden Company are recruited by Illyrio after Illyrio tells them of Fagon's true status as a member of the Blackfire line. The Golden Company, still loyal to House Blackfire, drops their current contract and agrees to support Fagon in an attempt to finally instill a Blackfire on the Iron Throne. As Illyrio says when Tyrion asks him how he could have possibly recruited the Golden Company to their cause, some contracts are written in ink, and some in blood. And thus, Varys' plan to sit Fagon on the Iron Throne is not an effort to reinstall the Targaryen dynasty. Varys is not a Targaryen loyalist. He is a Blackfire loyalist. This explains why he seemed to fuck the Mad King shit up and why he is working to destabilize the Seven Kingdoms. It explains how he was able to recruit the Golden Company to Fagon's cause. After realizing that every previous rebellion had failed, Varys comes up with a new approach. To disguise a Blackfire as a Targaryen a pretender, if you will, using him as a sort of Trojan horse to finally put a Blackfire on the throne. And thus, Fagon's campaign to take the Iron Throne is, in actuality, the sixth Blackfire Rebellion, masterminded by the Master of Whispers, the eunuch, the spider, Varus himself. But unfortunately, since Fagon is not in the show, and Daenerys is totally a Targaryen, and not a Blackfire, the Blackfire theory could not work in the show, since why would Varys support a Targaryen on the throne if he was actually a Blackfire loyalist? So because of this, Varys in the show is simply a Targaryen loyalist who believes Danny is the best chance the world has at a peaceful realm. Glad everything turned out just peachy. Anyway, that is all for today, fam. I hope we were able to give Varys a faithful ending that Conleth Hill wouldn't toss away in disgust. Next up, the reigning and undisputed king of the friend zone, Jorah Mormon. Jorah's arc in the show was not bad per se, with his loyalty and love for Daenerys being his most memorable and admirable character trait. But let's see if we can spice it up a little, perhaps by giving him a bit more agency in our next episode. Make sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, consider supporting me on Patreon, and I'll see you next time.